Skype's going, and I'll get my other one going, and yeah, that we are going. Great, Casey. Well, here I am. I'm Neil Grover, Grover Pro Percussion, here with Casey Cangalosi, <laughs> poser, performer, teacher. Uh, Casey, I think the first time I met you, well, you were a student at Boston Conservatory. That studying. sounds right. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, one of the teachers there, uh, Pat, had told me you were doing some really, really creative things. And Pat's a creative guy, so if he's saying that, I know it must be something interesting. And um, and the, tell me a little bit about uh, how you got into being such a creative person. Were you always interested in composing? Well, first, yeah, thanks so much. That's real nice of you, and thanks for being here. And, yeah, it's so nice of Pat to see that back way back when, Boston Conservatory, when most of the students that I feel like his track really was was the strict orchestral folks and – he was just happy to embrace someone who wasn't that way. And I guess I've been lucky. All my teachers have been that way. So, um, yeah. And actually, you know, a colleague said to me recently in one of those, those kind of long philosophical conversations we have with colleagues sometimes about like, are we teaching creativity enough? And are we teaching creativity young enough? And how can we teach creativity more? And I really don't think anyone knows that answer because, on on one hand, you see, you see like right now there's this big SpaceX project to send a bunch of artists to orbit around the moon. And the idea is, oh, they'll see the moon and they'll get all these cool creative ideas and they'll build art built around the moon. And one of the pitches that the, 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 fun, one, of the one of the funders or the funder says is what if Picasso had seen the moon up that close? Imagine what he would have created. And I think like, but maybe your imagination, like maybe lack of seeing things is what brings out that creativity in you. You know, like we hear from artists yeah. that say exactly that, you know, George R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones, he says, I was restricted to my little apartment growing up in the Bronx or Manhattan, I forget. And I was restricted to my little neighborhood and that meant my imagination could really flourish. So I don't, I don't think we really know how that works, you know? So I, that's yeah. all I can really say when I, I get in those conversations, but I will say, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people just being really encouraging. Of course, you know, people like Pat, people like Nancy there in Boston, Keith Leo, Sam Solomon there in Boston. I mean, you, when you brought me on as an artist and said, I like the creative stuff you're doing, do more creative stuff with my products. I mean, I think I've just been very lucky to be in a nice current of encouragement and as yeah, far as well, I can I, tell that's about all we can do you know well I think that's what's so cool about artistry uh, unlike you know um, uh, working uh, in a factory every artist is different everybody brings different things to the table and processes things differently uh, and then kind of absorbs and and creates their own person who, who they are you know it's interesting you said something about creativity because i remember aaron copeland hearing aaron copeland speak and he said when by the time he wrote rodeo which is one of the quintessential orchestral western pieces he had yeah. never been outside of new york city yeah you know so i think you're right i think it's the imagination and one thing that concerns me today uh, with people being busy all the time i think you need time just downtime just to let your mind wander and let creativity seep in. And I, yeah. I worry about children today having too many activities all the time and not being able to lie outside on the grass looking at the clouds picking their nose and being right. creative. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And it seems like the holes in our exposure are perhaps just as important as the exposure itself. Because I definitely know people who I think – have been treated to, I mean, actually a lot of the people I met while I was studying there in Boston, they went to like Juilliard Preparatory Academy and they had a, a private teacher coming into their high school because they had this, you know, really well-funded arts program in their high school and like couldn't have been more privileged. But then when it came to doing something a little outside the box, it was, seemed like the box was just it was just not there, you know, right. there wasn't enough space in the, that box. For maybe that. that's it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's it. And, and I think, you know, speaking of me specifically, I feel very lucky that I went to Utah state university, which was a, a program, you know, you've, you've never really heard of in for music. And 
it was one that ed degree, performance degree, uh, music therapy degree, uh, oddly enough, and um, didn't have an established composition program. I think we did technically have that, but there was, you know, one major or something. Mm -hmm. It was very, very, so I don't know. I I feel like if I had gone to a, a, a big program with a respected performance program as well as composition program, I wouldn't have been so encouraged to blend them. Like it just seemed natural to blend them. And I thought, well, certainly everybody composes. Isn't that what all the composer players did? So why wouldn't I do that? You know? Yeah. Well, I find your career so interesting because I, I, as an entrepreneur myself, I see a great entrepreneurial spirit in what you do and not, not only in the music you write, which incorporates elements that are so unique and different to me, like the trinome you used, and right. and, and and the thing with tambourine with the with the um, pre-record on the, the telephone. Right. And this is exciting to me, and and I like it. And I think people sometimes are afraid. They're afraid to go outside color, outside the lines. And I think in some some ways, the intense orchestral training and everybody's chasing these auditions certainly doesn't encourage anybody to go anywhere outside the lines. And here you are ignoring the lines and creating new lines, expanding it. So I really, I really admire that. And it's really refreshing. Um, what would you Thanks. say to young percussionists today who look up to you? And this is like, cause I, I, I know a lot of young percussionists. I always ask them, what do you want to do? And lately I'm hearing, I want to be like Casey Cangalosi and compose and, and, <laughs> teach nice. and and play i mean years ago everybody wanted to be in an orchestra but, right you know today it's changed and and i think you've set the bar pretty high uh in a good way so so what would you say to a young percussionist who who really wants to kind of find their own way yeah well thanks again and man that's where this gets kind of serious because now what you say matters <laughs> and it's it's like when we're just talking about me and you it's like well we can think and do and say kind of whatever we want and the only people in harm's way are ourselves so right and and i'll also add just just to what you were saying it's so it's so nice being a percussionist right now because i really I, I, i certainly find people who like don't like the music i write but they're not saying you know everyone's saying like cool keep keep doing that like no one is saying like what the heck man just play the rep you know Right. It seems like the spirit in percussion is what you described. It's just exploratory right now, and everyone's very encouraging to new ideas. And of course, we need new rep. But t- t- to your question, it's um, it's tough because on one hand, you want to tell a young person, well, you just you, whatever you're compelled to wake up to do is going to be the thing that ho- hopefully you can turn into your thing but sometimes that thing is well i want to get up and drink beer and then i want to smoke pot and then i want to drink beer again and then i want to i want to play snare drum for 10 minutes and then i want to drink beer again it's like well yeah that's not going to help you be good at percussion so sometimes it's a yeah it's a matter of just discipline and i try to remind them about composing specifically it's it's not this you know montage of insights uh, this wonderful feeling that last long into the night where you kind of lose yourself. <laughs> I don't know that right, like, they, right. like I think TV has maybe taught us about creative people. And, yeah. and if you dig around, you know, I'd say young people dig around and listen to other composers, certainly better composers than myself talk about this, that they say the same thing. They just say, it's a lot of just discipline. It's a lot of work. You know, that, that yeah. little moment of inspiration can be really quick. Yeah, and then you have to chase it for a yeah. long time after that, and and I really equate it to learning an instrument. You know, uh, yeah. w- we practice our instrument for the performance, and I don't know if people practice composing enough. It's interesting you say that. You know, it, it's um, uh, I know uh, from talking with John Williams about uh, his compositional. A discipline. He writes every day and set at same hours every day. And he goes to his office and he writes. Wow. And it's very disciplined, kind of what you said. And I, and I think people have this Hollywoodized version of, you know, yeah. you're going to so all of a sudden this divine intervention comes in and you write a symphony. Right, yeah. right. Like it comes to you in a dream yeah. or something. Right, and, right. Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it, it, the whole creative process is interesting. And I, and I agree with you. I think, 
in percussion, we're going through a period of a very exciting period where people, I think, are just trying to find new ways to use uh, percussion to express themselves. For sure, for and, sure. And I see a lot of electronic and digital stuff coming in, and certainly you've incorporated some of the some outside the norm uh, uh, sounds and techniques, and and uh, you know, what really knocked me out is. You know, you're also a great snare drummer. You 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 play everything so great, and you're so creative, and it it's um it's really nice and refreshing to see, especially for those of us who have over the years have taught and have sat on juries and hear the same pieces over and over again. At one point, if I heard "Yellow After After the Rain" again, I was going to commit suicide because right. you know it, it's everybody was playing. This is years ago, the same thing. So it, it's nice uh, to have. Uh, discover new pieces and hear new things. Yeah, well, 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 thanks again. And it, it, just back to young people real quick, something something else, a conversation I find myself in is if someone says, I, I want to I be a composer, I say, great, what have you written? And they say, oh, well, nothing yet. It's so like, oh, well, not even like anything? No, no, nothing. Like, well, then how do you know that's what you want to do you know what i mean like if you wanted right. to do it and that's what i meant about the you wake up and you you do what you're compelled to do and hopefully you're just you're compelled to do that and if and if you're not i mean if you're in the in the state that i just described like well i want to compose i haven't done it yet you can learn that impulse you know you can build that impulse into your routine and into your environment but it right. yeah it really just has to become uh, an itch you know i, I right that that's the best, and I, I'm sure you can you can absolutely relate to it. And we could probably go down this same rabbit hole with your creating of instruments. I oh, mean, it's I the imagine. same thing. It's just a different yeah. medium. I mean, exactly. I, I think of myself. I might be painting with oils, and you're painting with watercolors. Exactly. We're both still painting. You know? Right. And I imagine if you, that, or maybe there was a time at least where if you weren't sketching or you weren't working on something, you just felt kind of like have this like itch in your body oh, absolutely well yeah. i'll give you an example today when i should have been doing actually my real work in my office <laughs> i was in back in the shop experimenting with some new type of felt and, right and 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 treating it with different chemicals and then and you know i should have been actually working but i actually right. was doing what i love doing you know stephen stuckey has a nice little quote in in one of the lectures he gave and it's on youtube you can look up stephen mm -hmm. stuckey lecture and he, and he says Something along the lines of, you know, even at the top of the composition field, there's there's really no glamour in this. It, the only thing that's gonna really make you do it is that that itch yeah. and that drive. And you know, I forget Malcolm Gladwell calls it one thing, and Anders Ericsson, who Malcolm Gladwell's research really comes from, he calls it another thing. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's Angela Duckworth calls it the grit, and I think that's my favorite. My mm -hmm. favorite the grit. My, I like my that. favorite yeah. term because like you just you just have to go after it and right. and it's it's kind of a nasty relationship, but it's also one that you just like have to right. know, you, you have to have. Are they I've heard it referred to as you get the bug. The, the bug, bug is something. It's a gotta you got it it's like a com compulsion to do something. Exactly. Uh, absolutely. So if somebody asked you t taking your typical uh, month and Breaking it into a pie chart, what percentage of time would you devote, saying, to teaching versus performing versus composing? Oh, geez. There, there is probably a real answer to that, and it'd be, man, it'd be easy to figure out, but I'm just not prepared for it. Well, but, just uh, a guess. Just a guess. Yeah, sure. I think when the year's going, it's, it's probably... Jeez. I mean, like, oh, my teaching schedule. I mean, if you go through my teaching schedule... I've got 10 hours of private students and I've got six hours of ensemble and I'm not there every minute of that ensemble time. But yeah, so I mean, if you want to call that, uh, let's call it 12 hours to be to be safe. And one of those is studio class and two of them are our class called Freshman Techniques. But I'm only there for one of them. So I don't know. Yeah, let's say let's say 12 or 13 hours and then geez, a good chunk of your life goes to email and just keeping up with <laughs> all of that. And I mean, you know, th the truth is the amount that we practice now is just not what it used to be. And I guess that's, 
I guess that's okay. It's kind of sad because there is that itch <laughs> to do that that's yeah. becoming less and less. But then again, when when we were students and we were in our master program practicing six hours, eight hours a day, you also told yourself like, yeah, you, you can't do this for the rest of your life. Right. There was a goal. There was an end, end game. Yeah. yeah so it, it's, it's, you miss it in a way, but, um, yeah, I, I would say I do get to practice every day a little bit. And then when I have chunks of time, I practice, I practice real good and I practice well. And, uh, it, it, sh- it could certainly be more, well, I'm more interested well. in terms of how much of your composing, how much of your creative, uh, self, how, how much time you can carve out for that yeah it's it's really not much especially now that we have a, a little 11 11 month year old little boy now so oh, it's congratulations oh thanks it's uh it's 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 certainly less but mm-hmm. yeah I, I think back to kind of how i was describing composition the ideas come and they're very quick and then it's just a matter of committing it to paper and planning it out and that i find i'm able to to do because I'm not a measure by measure person. I'm a mm-hmm. have have the big idea, mm-hmm. and then it's very easy to chip away at it because you you kind of know the whole plan. You know where it's going to go, and and sometimes the plan is very simple, like the, like the piece I wrote with your your beautiful synthetic head tambourine. The the thank you. The, <laughs> the black. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool piece. That's oh, cool. thank that's and that's a cool tambourine. I was so happy that how that turned out and how that sounds, and I've taken that all over the world. I took it to Spain with me just recently and, cool. and do that. anyway, but, um, yeah, you know, like having the big picture plan for the piece, it, it's not like, Oh, I necessarily have this super detailed form or real mathematically solid form that everything's going to follow. I mean, sometimes it's just as simple as no, I really can see what this is going to convey and what the energy of the piece is going to be and how long it's going to be. And once at least that's in place, yeah, you, you can chip away. Even even mm-hmm. with like, okay, I found ten minutes in between lessons, I can pick up that tambourine or I can pick up a pen and paper and I can actually get some some work done. Absolutely, absolutely. If I uh, asked you to tell me what would I find on your uh, iPad or your phone in iTunes, that would surprise me. What, that would surprise you. What music would I like see in there? <laughs> I can't believe you're listening to this. Is there anything? Oh yeah, you'd find you'd find the new Hate Eternal album. It's just uh-huh. like super heavy metal. Uh huh. With the with crazy drummers and crazy guitar players. Uh huh. Uh huh. Cool. Yeah, that's so, probably the latest. And do you play drum set? Do you? Do you yeah, I mean, drum set was really the first love. You know, it's not something that I was I was able to keep on the same track and energy that it started from. But right. yeah, there, you know, I'm a classical percussion teacher, but there's a drum set in my office. And Did you start on drums? or? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was born in 82 in a, uh, in a you know, kind of modestly modest income household, which meant there was MTV on at all times with mm-hmm. uh, older mm-hmm. teenage siblings. So mm-hmm. it was, uh, yeah, it was MTV all the time back when there was actually music on MTV. Yeah, yeah. And, and do so, any of yeah. your, any other family members musicians or play instruments or? No, my father actually. My my dad is so interesting because he found this new love for a dobro. Oh, and, oh. and he played guitar a little bit when he mm-hmm. was when he was much younger. But you know, he injured his hand. He had this atrophy in his hand, which was really really bad for him because he 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 needs to type on his keyboard. He's a math professor at Utah State. And, um, but yeah, in the, just the last, God, last five or six years, he just found this new love for this little, little instrument mm-hmm. called the Dobro, which. Oh, is, it's a great instrument. Yeah. 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 Maybe some listeners might not know it's basically a slide guitar, you know, it's a right. type of slide guitar, but, um, he's, it's really helped his hand kind of come back uh-huh, and uh-huh, uh-huh. he's, he's, he writes this music and records this music and. It's, uh, he'll tell you, oh, it's really, really bad. And it, but it's, it's gotten just, it's really gotten good. And he just, he just really, really likes it. So, um, but when I was younger, he did some, and then my parents offered piano lessons. My sisters took piano lessons for a few years. 
And I think I was just a bad kid. I did one piano lesson and then stopped. I was probably too young, but drum lessons stuck. So, so it sounds like there was always music though around. Yeah, We're hearing there was music. music yeah. Around. yeah, I think that's so key. I think because I always had music that since I can remember as a little kid, always in our house, and I think hearing it, even though you might not be studying or playing an instrument, just hearing it, I think develops the ear at an I early think age. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine it wouldn't, you know, or at least it develops your your instinct. You know, I know when I talk to students and, you know, the phrasing is wrong or they're just not selling this piece or this passage, it's, it's so hard to prescribe what to instinctually do. You can tell them crescendo here, diminuendo there, but you've, ha- you've had that student that they have a diminuendo and a retardando leading to a cadence and the pacing is just weird or... It's right, like they, right, they suddenly right. slow down and they don't know how to pace it right. And you're just like, right. ah, okay, well, you need to do it more gradually. And you, yeah. you, you tell them exactly what to do, but you also at the same time just wonder like, no, that's just not how we hear. Right, right. You know? I used to, when, as a student, I got a student where I was having trouble with a transition like that, especially an accelerando or the, the accelerando. I would keep a tennis ball in my office and I'd, I'd make <laughs> them stop and I'd throw it up and it let it bounce to stop. And you, oh, it's nice. naturally accelerating. Ah, oh, that's cool. I say, listen to this and try and emulate it. And oh, once I got like the that. emulation, then I said, now you could shape it a little bit. But I wanted them to grasp a natural type of accelerando using gravity in, in some way. Oh, I love that. You know, I, I think I'll have to steal that to demonstrate the You're pacing. Yeah. Because, because imagine you drop the tennis ball and then you tell the student, imagine... You know, you can see how many times it's going to bounce, and there's a natural way we're used to seeing that. But what if we took away ten of the bounces? You know, you skipped. Right, right. You know, the ball right. wouldn't do that. You got to. Right. Know. I kind of got that idea from Fred Hinger. Fred Hinger, but he used to use a tennis ball to teach timpani touch tone. So he'd right. have the students bounce the ball like this to develop that kind of, you know, that touch. That flow. I always thought that was a very cool approach, uh, even though I use that stroke. Not often in my playing, but I thought it was a really interesting way to, to demonstrate it. So I, I started thinking about other ways to use balls and gravity. and uh-huh. and Because uh, it's, it's, it's so hard to explain sometimes. You could play it as a teacher, but sometimes it's easier to demonstrate, just let go of a ball and saying, watch this. It's, it's very hard to stick with that for very long because I find I tell them, yeah, look, it's not yeah. all arm. It's not all wrist. It's this. Yeah. yeah. And you do a few exercises. You do like some early Goodman exercises. Right, right. And there's only a few pages of those, and then it goes on. As soon as the music gets harder, those bad habits come back in. Right. And suddenly right. they're all, they're wrist only or they're arm only. And right. I don't know. I feel like there's a pressure to keep, to keep it fun, to keep it stimulating, to keep it interesting, and to keep them motivated. But... You know, maybe we just got to go back to that, <laughs> that the tennis ball hanger. Well, method. you know, I remember once a few doing more weeks. A, rehearsing Wazo Exotique, and it, it wasn't going as, uh, uh, and, and Messian was there, and he wasn't the happy. Oh, jeez. He stopped the rehearsal. This oh, was in Tanglewood, and he made the whole orchestra sit there and listen, and there were birds in the rafters chirping out because wow. we were in the, we're in the shed outside. I sat there for about 20 minutes just listening to birds, and then resumed the rehearsal. And it was much better. <laughs> really? He was much happier. Oh, yeah. Because he wow. didn't think, you know, we weren't getting it. We just, it was everybody was counting and, you know, too, too worried about accuracy and things like that. And uh-huh. he wanted, you know, he wanted us to listen to the birds and pay attention, and try and be bird-like. What were you playing? I wasn't playing xylophone, thank goodness. Uh, or bells, jeez. I think I was playing bells, actually. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I, it was tough. That was a hard part. I've only done the gongs. Yeah. I've which done was the still gong. Actually, hard. I did the gongs with Pat. We, the two of us were playing them once. But yeah, it was a long time ago. and he. Uh, but I'll never forget that because we were all, you know, he. It, 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 at first we thought he was crazy. Right. He's stopping rehearsal. We have limited rehearsal. He wants to sit there listening to birds. But it, it, it made a lot of sense. Wow, that's really yeah. cool. That's cool. Very so cool. what's what's coming up? What's uh, new and exciting? Do you have anything you're working on now? I'm writing some music for my wife and I to finally play. My my hope is to have a few pieces done this summer for us to work up and record. What does she play? 
So she's a percussionist. Oh, great. And she studied in Boston, too. She was oh, another really? Boston oh. Conservatory oh, student. Great. Yeah, after I was there. So we uh-huh. didn't overlap there. We, we overlapped elsewhere. But, um, yeah, great pianist and, and percussionist. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, she's got the Nancy Marimba degree. So. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, she teaches with me here at JMU. Oh, great. Oh, great. And what's her name? Laurel. Laurel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Laurel Black. And let's see, I've got a commission to finish for and the the Steel Pan All-Star Liam Teague. I don't know if you know Liam. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know him personally. I know his work's great. Oh, yeah, he's, man, yeah, I, I couldn't be more terrified to, to write a piece for someone. <laughs> I mean, he's the nicest guy in the world, and he can play anything, so that's not why I'm scared, but... Everything that, always, that always seemed like a strange instrument to learn to me, be, just the way the notes are laid out, and you know, having it not being uh, standardized and yeah. trying to figure it out. I guess you know, I never, never. When I was going to school, nobody played pan. Uh, only the guys in Trinidad. Right. I mean, schools didn't have pan programs. It's totally unheard of. Uh, now, yeah. now I hear some great, great stuff. Oh yeah. Well, and that's that's why it's uh, so difficult. It's just I don't know Pan, and and right. we've had a few conversations, and one of the reasons he says, no, you'd be good for this because you don't know Pan. <laughs> like, do it, and right. it, that means you'll bring something different. And it's like, oh man. I, so anyway, it's. I guess you very, won't be writing many glisses then. Right, no glisses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's hard to wrap my head around Pan solo because it, it's much easier to write when you, if one of the instruments involved is something you you know the the idiosyncrasies of and you have a lot of control over so i don't i don't know much about the violin but if i was writing something for vibraphone and violin it would be a lot easier than solo right. violin right, right right yeah so i feel the same way with solo pan a little bit but um, yeah i'll do that and theodore milkov we're talking about doing a piece and it's just i think a matter if i can do the length he wants in time and um that's it. Then, then I'm I'm working on stuff for my wife and I. Oh, cool. So when somebody contacts you about a commission, mm-hmm. who decides kind of the instrumentation? How long is that kind of collaborative uh, discussion you have with the with the uh, person? Yeah, it's uh, of course it varies, and I, I would say they're usually saying the instrumentation, and I kind of throw out a number. Like, you know, how would this sound to you? And if they say, oh, man, that's not what I was thinking. Because I think I think people have very different experiences with commissions. You know, some people have been on these very big consortiums and they're used to what the big composers will charge. You know, they know what it costs to get <laughs> the Joseph Schwantner second yeah. percussion concerto out there. So, um but then, but then there are other folks who they, they haven't had that experience. They just haven't seen those numbers, and you just don't know who you're talking to sometimes. Right. right. So, um, so then again, I guess it, it comes down to your own opinion of of what your time is worth and how much you want to write the piece. And that's usually the big one for me is is this one I can really get behind and I'm excited about, mm-hmm. and I can I can get an idea for. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, often often that's enough, and then it's very easy to to make the price very low, you know. Yeah, no, it sounds it 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 sounds like it's something. Once again, you have to use a lot of creativity to come up with a a number and a you know what you're going to write for and how long and uh, you know it's um, yeah. I've always wondered. I have friends who are painters, and I always ask them, "How do you know when the painting's done?" You know, right, and, and, and uh, they have different answers, and you know, huh. I guess it must be the same way. I would imagine as a composer yourself, hmm. you know, you may not always know how long it's going to be, or may go in a different direction. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true, and you know, for me, the the ending is really there first. You know, it brings me back to a, a conversation with a, a a friend who says. Uh, you know, I've he, he said I have no problem starting. Starting is fine. I have a hard time finishing. And I think, well, I have a, I have a really hard time fini- uh, starting because mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to start if I don't know kind of the plan. You know, if I don't, if I don't know what the ending is going to look like, you know, every note you write is leading to the end. Right, right. So, yeah, and, and that's often a good 
sign of a good performance you know when you know the piece is over you can really feel the piece is over because i think we've we've watched those performances before where you realize after it's happened the piece is over you know it's kind of like oh oh i see that was the end right sometimes i feel boy that the composer ran out of ideas it just never right. developed sometimes that it didn't i didn't see a if if I have trouble identifying form in some way, mm -hmm. any even just the smallest amount of form, then I start to wonder: Is it me or is it the composition? Am I just not hearing it, or right. is or, it not or, there? Or is it the performer too? I think it can be the performer. Yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of those snare drum etudes we teach and are on all the audition tapes and right. the summer tapes and everything. Right. You know, sometimes it's hard to know right when it ended because the student is just being so literal and so exact and playing everything so straight faced. Right. And it's like, man, you got to I, I just want to see some expression, at least in a real performance, maybe not in a, a tape or something. But, um, you know, you will know when the when it's over. Absolutely. You, you said something earlier that really um, resonated with me about having fun. That uh -huh. I think so many today. I. I I, I went in. I went into uh, not long ago. I was working with a high school percussion all-state group, and I'm working with them, and we're playing, and they all look like they were in pain, and mm. I just stopped them. I said, "Look, do me a favor. Will you please make a mistake or two? I said yeah. because it's good. I'm not going to yell. It's going to be great, but I want you to have fun. Right. And once that they realize that I'm not going to like bite their head off if they if they make a mistake. Everybody relaxed and had a lot of fun. And, and I, I think that's missing a lot. I think people are so intense and so worried about making an error. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, I'd rather swing for the fence. You're going to miss sometimes. Mm -hmm. But be passionate about it. And um, Yeah. Well, and, and I think there's nothing, there's nothing more fun than, I mean, what were we playing? We were playing um, oh, one, of those Bob, one of those Bob Becker pieces with, with the JMU group here and my, my doctoral student Caleb's playing the snare drum solo uh, New Than or I, I forget what those pieces are called but it, it was one of those and um, you know he, he had something where he's repeating the same lick for this long stretch and he's the soloist and he's killing it and he just got totally lost and he just smiled and looked at his <laughs> his fellow student there mm -hmm. lucas and lucas like smiled back while he was playing and they they just knew right there like oh caleb's totally lost okay great i'm gonna cue him back when we're at this certain spot and they like mm -hmm. i don't know there's just like so much joy in that little mistake yeah yeah you know no. i don't know i feel like you have to experience that once or twice and then no. you're, you're more sold on the idea of like oh maybe it's not always about like no perfect you know uh, uh, absolutely. Well, it's funny. I heard a story recently about a very famous jazz musician, and and somebody heard him play a piece and wanted to record it. And they got to the recording session, and the jazz player plays it, of course, differently than he played it in the club. And the producer says, "No, no, no. Play it the way you played it the other night. Let's do it again." And he played it again, and it was different, even a third time. And they went on. Finally, the producer realized he can't. He's not going to play it exactly the same way twice. Right. Cause it's that, he, that's not what jazz musicians do. It's not what he does. Yeah. So it's okay. It's okay. And I, I, I you know, I remember having a, a jazz teacher once saying, you know, jazz is no wrong notes, just better choices than others. So right. You know, they're all leading somewhere or coming from somewhere else. And even if you hit a quote clam, if you could resolve it <laughs> some way, then it, you'll undo that as a mistake. It's, it's, it just it works. Our new con our new conductor here, Foster Byers, is just one wonderful our new wonderful orchestra conductor. We were putting together a little faculty ensemble of um, um, uh, Song of the Earth, the Mahler, the Schoenberg mm -hmm. arrangement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, or Song to the Earth. Um, the, there's a chamber version by arranged by Schoenberg, and um, yeah, the, you know, s some days this one part would be in a fast four, then other days it would be in two. So uh, my, my my friend Eric Genovan is a the composition faculty and percussionist here. You know, it didn't didn't bother us at all. We were fine. It's just you know, but but sometimes he would get asked like, "Will you be in two? Or will you be in four there?" And I loved his answer. It was, uh, well, we should be about here. I I might go into four. It's like just just it's okay. Just you can be flexible. <laughs> you know, right, like right, right. And and I just like that he he. he yeah, well, if, I don't if he's in yeah. four, it, it's going to be roughly twice as fast as 
beating as it would be in two. And if you know, right, it's gonna you be should cl- sense that. Yeah, it's it's gonna be close, but he's also just like not not his goal isn't to have a set consistent thing. Right, his goal right. is to chase the moment. Right, right. You know, and it, and that could be maybe the 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 four beat and the the halftime. It's gonna end up being the same tempo, but he's just saying, "I'm gonna chase the feeling," you know. Yeah. Well, in, in the same way, I, uh, I I hear jazz musicians playing, and they'll double go into double time, but they don't. They they never prearrange it. They don't say in bar six hundred seventy two, let's go into double time. Right. It just happens, yeah. you know. But they all feel it, and they go, and then they come out of it. Yeah. Uh, there's something nice about that spontaneity, and that uh, yeah, it's magical. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Well, Casey, I don't want to keep you all night. You, you have a young child. Is there is there anything kind of you want to say or you'd like to add to the conversation that maybe, you know, people uh, should hear or would like to hear? Oh, no. I, no, I think those, those were really great questions. And I don't know. I'm just – it's nice that we can even do this and that people will listen. And thanks thanks to you so much for having me as a Grover artist. And oh, it's my pleasure. Well, it, you know, chat. this is great. And um, I really appreciate – appreciate you making time and if somebody wants to contact you can they contact you through the website your website yeah there's an email listed there or at facebook i'm usually faster on facebook if they want to contact i just discovered this little thing called message requests so if someone who's not your friend messages you it'll go to message requests so i'm still catching up on those but i'll i'll now I'll now see them them all and, and, and all that good stuff. And I should say, man, I'm sorry I screwed up the Facebook Live thing the other no, day. No, no, no. This sure. is fine. This is fine. <laughs> it's 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 uh, you know, actually I think this is this is gonna work out better. And thank you for showing me how to do this with Skype. Sure. I'm kind of a, a a newbie to a lot of this, but I have to say everybody in my age bracket, I'm doing better than all my colleagues uh, from a uh, technology <laughs> standpoint. Most of them can't even use a smartphone. So. <laughs> Well, Casey, yeah. thanks a lot. Listen, happy holidays and, and, a, and a happy, healthy start to the new year. And uh, thanks so much. I appreciate it. You too, Neil. Yeah, great to okay. see you as always. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. All right. Take it easy. Bye-bye. <laughs>